Good afternoon. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of you for attending this uh, event, which is taking place, uh, that it is taking place at all, has required the aid of too many persons for me to list now. Although I wish first of all to thank uh, my own department, the Department of Philosophy and Religion, uh, for their indefatigable support of this event and the many logistics attending its realization. Also in that regard, I'd like to thank the President's Office. Uh, but first of all, uh, Dr. Matthew Gaetano, who introduced me to Professor Ulrich Lehner from Notre Dame, uh, through which connection we were able to uh, have the Cardinal come here. I'd also like to thank my enthusiastically supportive wife, Catherine, and my children who have borne with my absence and fatigue over many days. There are many others uh, who have been involved in this, uh, especially the Catholic Society, uh, whom I hope to have the opportunity to thank more directly in the days to come. His Eminence Cardinal Gerhard Ludwig Mueller was born on New Year's Eve in 1947 in Finthen, a borough of Mainz then in West Germany. After graduating from high school where he read Augustine's City of God in Latin, he studied philosophy and theology and in 1977 received his Doctorate of Divinity for a thesis on the Protestant theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer and then a second Doctorate in Theology in 1985 for a dissertation on the theology of the communion of saints. He was ordained a priest a year later in 19, uh, a year after his first doctorate in 1978 and pastored at three parishes. Eventually he was appointed the Bishop of Regensburg, Germany in 2002 by Pope John Paul II and he chose as his Episcopal motto, Dominus Jesus, Jesus is Lord. In 2007, Pope Benedict XVI appointed Mueller for a five-year term as a member of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, at which he served as the prefect from 2012 to 2017. The Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, a position once held by now Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, is responsible for maintaining the doctrinal continuity of the Catholic Church. More popularly, the congregation is known, somewhat misleadingly, as the successor to the Inquisition, that being the Roman Inquisition and not the more reviled and less expected Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> he became the ex officio president of the Pontifical Biblical Commission, the International Theological Commission, and the Pontifical Commission Ecclesia Dei. That's more commissions than I would care to serve on. His term at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith ended in 2017, and since then he has been named a member of the Supreme Tribunal of the Apostolic Signatura, a kind of constitutional court for the Catholic Church since June of 2021. It may be asked why Hillsdale College, a non-sectarian Christian liberal arts institution, would make such a fuss about a Catholic Cardinal Archbishop, a man who wears a fifth century dress and goes about being called your eminence and having his ring kissed. So I should like to meditate on his regalia in order to suggest why he is here. The word theology comes from the Greek theologia, meaning an account of God, not the myth-making of the ancient pagan poets, but rather an effort to say what is beyond words, an effort to give an account of God oriented toward a relationship with him. A relationship with God can only be rooted in his own self-revelation. For just as we cannot derive an account of our friends without actually coming to know them, so too we cannot give an account of God by which to cling to him in faith and love unless he first has disclosed himself to us. That, in the end, is why a cardinal archbishop wears fifth century garb and goes about having his ring kissed. On the ring is an image of Saints Peter and Paul, a fisherman and a tent maker who bore witness to the Son of God who walked the earth and lived as one of us. When we call a cardinal archbishop your eminence, we point beyond him to the source of all eminence, to God without whom he and we are nothing. We kiss the ring of Peter and Paul because it is only by the witness of them that we know of Jesus Christ. And it is only Jesus Christ who would make all of us eminent. 
Today, he has come to speak about this, to speak about preaching, to speak about the Lord who revealed himself to us and how we might come to know him. At Hillsdale, a liberal arts education is oriented toward a sensitization toward the good and a pursuit of the true. And so from the point of view of this college, a great theologian such as Cardinal Mueller is no peripheral Catholic celebrity. Rather, he comes to speak on the very center of a liberal arts education, an education which in the end, if it is fully to humanize us, must transform as well as sensitize us to the true and the good. The true and the good which, from the theologian's point of view, must have its end in worship if it is to be true, if we are to finally become what we study. Ladies and gentlemen, his eminence, Cardinal Gerhard Mueller. Thank you very much to you all for this heartly welcome. We all are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. It's not only an idea, but it's a real person, is the Son of God who became flesh, one of us. It is an often made claim that every difference between Catholicism and Protestantism, both in their basic conception of Christianity as a whole and in their individual doctrines, can be traced back to the incompatibility between a church of sacraments and a church of the word. Over a hundred years ago, German liberal theologist, theology's guiding star, Adolf von Hardnack, Adolf von Hardnack identified as Martin Luther's Reformation break breakthrough the victory of the Protestant principle of grace over Catholic sacramentalism. Even though to Hanak's mind, Luther had weakened his own triumph by clinging to sacramental no notions such as infant baptism and the real bodily presence of church in the Lord's Supper. Luther, the reformer of the church according to the gospel, the revolutionary who overcame the church as an institution of salvation, this institutionalism, had continued to believe in objective means of grace contrary to his own system. By doing so, Hanak believed, Luther has risked forfeiting the fundamental Protestant insight that grace is something purely spiritual, that besides word and faith, everything else is indifferent. But perhaps is in not holding everything else to be indifferent, Luther understood the teachings of Christ better than did Hanak. Indeed, Hanak's affection for the purely spiritual led him to oppose the belief that God, the Son himself, has actually lived as one of us. Along with this, the very premise of Christianity, Harnack rejected also Christ's redemptive death and resurrection from the death for the salvation of mankind. For Harnack's Church of the Word and of Faith represents the true principle of Protestantism. Then we should have to abandon any ecumenical search for Jesus' desired unity lapsing instead into a pursuit merely of good relations between what we are, in the end, in reconciliable religions. <clears throat> but things may not be so bad as all that, for Hanak is both a poor interpreter of Christ and an unfaithful expounder of Luther. Today, I will suggest that on biblical, historical, and dogmatic grounds, a church of the word and of faith is not irreconcilable with a church of the sacraments, but that the distinction represents chiefly a difference in theological approach, 
a different that is not an insurmountable Protestantism and Catholicism to differ, and in a substantial ways, but word and sacrament is not ultimately the line of division. In this talk, I will first ask what we mean by preaching, and I will argue in light of the incarnation and human nature that sacraments are a form of preaching as deeds alongside words. Second, I will propose that the existence of these deeds of Christ through the Church does not reflect conflict with the principles of the sola fide and solus Christus. Lastly, I will acknowledge, acknowledge certain differences between Luther and Catholicism while I reflect upon the relationship between the Christ's preaching and our spiritual lives. First, what does it mean to preach Jesus as the word incarnation, in word incarnate? What do we preach when we preach Christ? Not just a message, but God the Son himself. Against Harnack's claims, Jesus' preaching is not first a philosophical or psychological insight into the world, nor a rational program to improve social conditions, far less an agenda of self-creation by which to reconstruct ourselves or found some new world order without God's help and grace. No, we must not preconceive Jesus in the image of what we think we need. We must turn to God's testimony about him and we must consider how he is made known to us. While in the history of salvation, God spoke in many ways to his chosen people through the preaching of the prophets, now in the fullness of time, in these last days, he has spoken to us through the Son, the Word of God, Hebrews. The Word, what was with God and is one God with the Father, took on the flesh of our humanity and lived as one of us. Jesus, the Word, the same single person, existed eternally in the divine life and now lives also humanly. He is the mediator both of the first creation and of the humanity's reconciliation with God. By him we have forgiveness, by him we become the children of God. The fathers, the father, Divine Father speaks through the word, his son, Jesus, this word of God, of the Father, speak thus. The time is fulfilled in the beginning of his uh, openly uh, preaching. Is, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, present. Repent and believe in the gospel. His amazed listeners understood that he thought them as one having authority, that is, divine authority, not as a scribe's human authority. To him, the living bread that came down from heaven. Peter confesses this divine divinity and messianic role for the church in every age. Lord, to whom shall we go? We all. Who shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know you are the Holy One of God, the Word of God, the Son of God. Words in plural. We have words as human being as many words, but as God is only the Word, the divine Word in the plurality of human words. It is by preaching, then, that Jesus graciously reveals himself as God the Son, as truth and life, fulfilling man's longing for knowledge and love of God. This preaching, Augustine of Hippo tells us, 
goes beyond his words. By becoming incarnate, God the Word translated his divine life into human life, somewhat as when we talk. Our thought takes on the form of spoken utterance. Christ's example of how to live translates the divine life in no other mode than in human. Scripture and historical Christianity then suggest that the church of the world cannot be confined to a purely spiritual, in an idealistic sense, for God who is spinned reveals himself incarnately. For an authentic church of the world, then we look not to Hanak, but to the great Lutheran theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who died in the Nazi camp, but as a great witness of Jesus Christ. He wrote, for the original preached word is the incarnate Christ himself, not preaching about Jesus Christ, but he is the content of the preaching. The incarnated Christ is God. Thus God's preaching is Christ himself, God as man, Christ as word. As a word, he walks through the congregation, the congregation of this is the church, the assembly of the believers. If we follow Bonhoeffer, the preaching of the church must communicate this word, the logos, the God, the Son. That is preaching, that its preaching may confirm to the incarnation. The church must be a church of the world in two senses. First, I must face, it must faithfully transmit Jesus' own self-revelation of himself as God the Word incarnate as Messiah. With Simon Peter, the entire church must confess, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Biblical expression, living God against the dead gods of the pagans, therefore the son of the living God, the real God. Second, it must be faithful to how he reveals himself. Otherwise, the church's constitution would not conform to Christ, who is a mediator of our salvation. Christ reveals himself not only in a word, but also in deed. Through the church, Christ pre preaches himself doing so equally by the proclamation of the gospel as his words and by the sacrament as his deeds. For a human being to have a personal, immediate relationship to God, the gospel of the kingdom must be addressed to the whole human being. Christ communicates himself in both word and deed because God created the human person in a bodily social and historical condition. Within this condition, all human relationships are realized, so to our personal, personal immediacy to God. Persons immediate to God, but we cannot realize it. We can realize our immediacy to God only in our bodily social existence. This has consequences for our understanding of the church of the word. If Christ reveals himself indeed, that is mediated by bodily, corporeal actions in the concrete physical world, then our own relationship with God cannot exclude a priori the corporeal sacramental mediation of his grace in the apostolic church nor if Christ reveals, reveals himself in word, can our conscience hold on truth be somehow opposed to the existence of a teaching authority in that same church. Rather, these pairings correspond both to the manner of Christ's self-revelation and to the bodily, spiritual, and social nature of each human being. Harnack for all his supposed sensitivity to the state of man, imposes 
an unbiblical, dualistic, Cartesian, Cartesius understanding of the human person. With the essence of man in his thinking spirit, res cogitans, set over against the supposedly lower to material and bodily nature, res extensa, that holds the spiritual in bondage. Christ incarnate himself did not live that. And where the church to live is the way opposing word to sacrament, she would be not scriptural but subservient to a bastardized platonic opposition between the higher world of the ideas of the poor spirit against a lower sense world. Such dualism, dualisms, in this, this, this form dialectical dualisms are inauthentic to the human life that God created and that Christ came to save. True, our very nature is defined and our lives guided by conscious self-reflection, by active understanding of our own being. Nevertheless, our bodily integration into the material world does not distract us from what is real. Rather, along with conscious understanding, bodily life is a core principle of human flourishing in the world, a world that God created for and addressed to the human precisely as a spiritual bodily creature. Matter cannot be an inhibiting counter principle of man's existence, as if man were a juxtaposition of heterogeneous parts and conflicted principles. If the material was not worth only a lower principle, it was under understandable that God became flesh. No? Surely our flesh, our body, is a reality belonging to us and is the accuracy also of the salvation. That is why, as we saw in Augustine's analogy with the incarnation, even our thoughts are formed into words and spoken in words that have a kind of acoustic and social body by which we understand ourselves within and communicate ourselves outwardly to others. Our thoughts put into words externalize our self-knowledge, our knowledge of the world, our communication with others, and above all, our intimacy with God. By words verbalized with lips and tongue, we address the face of Jesus with the Apostle Thomas spoke in the face of Jesus, my Lord and my God. It is Lord and God not behind the human nature, but in the human nature of Jesus Christ. And if we look, we look in the face of Jesus, man, we see in his face God the Father. Or with St. Augustine, we pray, you have created us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. But our bodily existence does not end with the movement of our lips. Therefore, sensible signs, gestures, and rites also expresses the interior word. For our sake, God interacts with us through words and deeds. He makes himself present in his revealed name. His revealed name, I am who I am. And Jesus communicates his Father's saving will by his actions. He truly heals the sick, entering the grace in the bodily existence, brings lepers back into community, and raises the dead to life. That is the importance of our bodily existence. Word and deed cannot conflict because Jesus is the word who become flesh. His words and his deeds reveal him as a word of God who took on flesh for our salvation. 
The words of the church, therefore, which Paul calls the pillar and bulwark of the truth, are both spoken and enacted, preached in word and sacrament. The sacraments are deeds of Christ in and through the church, but what is a sacrament? Augustine of Hippo gives us a very basic definition. A sacrament is an outward visible sign of some invisible grace. By grace here, Augustine means something broader than only God's freely given forgiveness. Grace is both God's unmerited activity toward humans, and it is the effect of this activity both in humans themselves and in their relationship with God. Faith itself is a grace. While not all denomination, denominations will agree on the relationship between the sign and the grace, the Catholic Church teaches that the sacrament instituted by Christ are outward signs of an invisible grace that God works through the sign by the power of the Holy Spirit. For God to work through the sign may seem to make the sacraments into rituals by which human mages capture and deploy divine power. But as with Christ's self-revelation in word and deed, here too we remember in every day we live, communicate, life communicate to one another through signs. In those who receive them, the communication can prompt a complete transformation, a regrounding of moral and spiritual life. Also, we are communicating with words, but the words are not only an information, a knowledge, but the good words of other people to us, towards us, is also a transformation of our existence and a renewal of our self-understanding. But in the church's word and sacraments, God himself is at work. The church preach, preaching does not merely declare, but transmits Christ's self-revelation by word and deed. This is not too bold if we acknowledge with both Luther and the Catholic Church that the Holy Spirit makes a difference between efficacious preaches and mere speaking. Through the church, it is Christ who makes present his gospel in word and sacrament. Because God works salvation in the believer through preaching, whether spoken or heard or enacted and received. When Christ speaks to us through the mouth of the commissioned witnesses, words bring about salvation in those who thereby come to believe in him as the Son of God. The Holy Spirit, moving us through preaching the faith to faith and conversion, to repentance and love, makes all true preaching, in this sense, sacramental, visible, tangible. A preaching by deeds, the sacraments can be understood as inst instruments of God's self-communication and salvation. Baptism instituted by Christ is a grace-filled self-communication of the word made flesh, as a gift of eternal life. Through baptism, the Holy Spirit causes faith in those who are baptized, so that Christ says, as, says we are reborn in water, visible things, and the Holy Spirit, the power of God, becoming his sons and daughters. Through the Son, in the Holy Spirit, we, will, we reply, Abba, Father, personal relation to God. Luther understood that preaching as preaching is inseparable from the activity of Christ and the Spirit, when in 1529 in the Marburg Colloquy uh, he defended against Zwingli the sacraments within a church of the Word. He is in baptism, the Lord, in the Lord's Supper, and in teaching until the end of the world, until he comes. And Luther conflicts neither with the Catholic tradition nor with his own Protestantism when he grounds this in the incarnation. I know God only as he became human. 
so I shall have him in no other way. Likewise, for the Catholic tradition, the sacraments belong to God's own efficacious preaching through the church. Preaching, second point, preaching in word and sacrament amidst the Protestant principles. This vision of being a church of word and sacrament poses no challenge to a Catholic self-understanding. But if Harnack was wrong about Christ, might he still have been right about Luther? But Luther lived up to his own principles by retaining sacraments. Let us consider just two as time permits. Sola fide, faith alone, et solus Christus, Christ alone. Sola fide, faith and the sacraments. Can the sacraments, as deeds or signs that are instruments of divine action, have a place in a church of the word? And faith, when faith means faith alone. The letter of the Hebrews tells us that without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who would approach God must believe that he is and that he will reward those who seek him. This seems to comfort ill with the Catholic Church teaching that the sacraments are effect ex opera operato from the deed alone. And to the reformers criticize this sacramental principle was seemed to hang human salvation on the deeds of the church ministers rather than on the Christ and the Christian faith. First, this is a misunderstanding of the ex op operato. Ex opera operato from the deed done means that the sacraments are effective not by the moral holiness of the human minister or recipient, but by Christ. For Christ is the actual minister of the grace that he personally communicates to concrete bodily social human beings through the sign acts that he instituted in the church. Second, even the primacy of Christ in ex opera operato does not exclude the importance of faith in the Christian recipient. For either the sacraments impart faith as in baptism, or their effect is received by faith, as in the Eucharist. Otherwise, we should be saved by submitting to an action of the sacrament, rather than by receiving Christ, who communicates himself through and in the sacraments. In keeping with these two points, the Council of Trent declares that we are justified by faith without preceding human works and merits in, in as much as faith is the beginning of human salvation, the foundation and root of all justification, without which it is impossible to please God and to enter into the fellowship, the fellowship of his children. Perhaps thou, you will say that I am being too hasty, but can we reconcile Jesus' claim that we are reborn by water and the Spirit, with St. Paul's statement that faith comes from hearing, the preaching of the word of Christ. Consider that we are saved only if we believe that Jesus is the Lord and that God raised him from the dead. Faith may have varying degrees of explicitness, but one cannot separate faith as a personal act, fides qua creditur, from the faith as an ascetic knowledge to his objective content, fides qua creditur, any more than one can separate the act of holding something from the anatomy of the hand and its configuration to the object held. Therefore, Christ instituted baptism as a sign and effects faith through this significant sacramental preaching. Our bodily spiritual constitution and Christ's incarnate mediation do not permit us to transcend, transcend all externals. By the same token, no external, externals are mere externals. 
If faith comes from hearing, our participation in baptism is a form of hearing. Ordinarily, in this life, the human mind does not know God directly in his own being, but in the accusation of conscience, in the thoughts formulated through our apprehension of the works of creation, and especially through, through the human nature of his Son. As Paul writes, the face of Christ is the glory of God for the knowledge of which God illumines our hearts. If faith is conceived only idealistically, spiritualistically, as a purely spiritual inner reverence to God, it is disincarnated. Only in this case could the sacramental mediation of salvation be misunderstood, misunderstood as a leftover relic of paganism, as if the use of sensible elements in the sacramental sign would of itself exert a magical effect on God. Harnack's opposition of a reformed church of the world against a corrupted Catholic church of the sacrament in a magical thinking thus fails in two ways. First, in light of Christian anthropology, which by virtue of the unity of man in God's creative will goes beyond the dualism of idealism and materialism of spirit and body, and second, in light of incarnational Christology, which presents the Son of God to us in his humanity as the one and only mediator between God and man. The sacraments may not intrinsically oppose sola fide, but what of solus Christus, Christ alone? I have called the sacraments God's deeds, but I have also called them the church preaching. Have we not only one mediator, Christ? How can the Catholic Church loftily call itself a minister and mediator of Christ's salvation? How can it claim to mediate Christ's grace by preaching him in word and sacramental rites? By virtue of his divine personal personhood and human nature that he assumed Christ is the only perfect mediator between God and man, ontologically. This St. Thomas Aquinas stated as a full Catholic conviction of faith 300 years before the Reformation's Solus Christus. But this does not dismiss the fact that the prophets and the priests of the Old Testament were also called mediators between God and man as forerunners, forerunners and servants of the future Messiah. This applies all the more of the Christ's ministers who minister the word to us in truthful preaching and saving sacraments. Paul absolutely removed from the presumptuous notion that man can obtain salvation from God by his own power, or that man can by their own power impart grace, calls to the Corinthians to consider the apostles, the bishops, coming bishops and priests, but apostles, as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. The apostles and their ordained successors in the ministry of preaching, sanctification, and pastoral leadership are entrusted by Christ with a ministry of reconciliation. Thus Paul can say of himself and all the apostles, we are therefore sent in Christ's stead, and it is God who admonishes through us. We ask you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Just as Jesus said of himself that he who sees me sees the Father, he can only say to the apostles that he himself chose, called, and empowered, he who hears you hears me, and he who rejects you rejects me, but he who rejects you rejects him who sent me. In this sense, 
apostles and the bishops are ministers and mediators, but not in this ontological sense, but in sacramental sense. It is a risen Lord himself who presents us with the synthesis of an approach to preaching by word and by sacrament, with the exception of the traitor Judas Iscariot, the disciples whom he had made his apostles and to whom he had given authority to minister salvation, are approached by the risen Lord who says to them, to, all, to me all authority has given in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always until the end of the earth. Thus Aquinas can also write, the priests of the new covenant may be called mediators between God and man in as much as they are ministers of the true mediator, dispensing the mysteries of salvation to man in his stead, in his name. The preaching of the apostles and their successors is nothing other than the word and teaching of the Son of God in the mouth of the church, in so far as she is a confessor and witness of his message and the instrumental mediator of his ongoing saving activity. The co-workers and successors of the apostles are bishops, presbyters, priests, and pastors. When this proclaims sound doctrine in holy authority, the soundness is not merely in faithfulness to a doctrinal system or a text, but rather in the living word of God. Preaching and deeds are probably sacramental because they are wielded by the Holy Spirit to accomplish their purpose. If the church is mediator in Christ's stead, as Paul says, it is because Christ and the Spirit and not we poor ministers are the true authors of the church acts. For this reason, the Second Vatican Council states, in order to complete God's universal saving action in and through her, Christ is always present in his church, especially in her liturgical celebration. He is present in the sacrifice of the mass, not only in the person of his minister, but especially under the Eucharistic speeches. By his power, he is present in the sacrament. So when a man baptizes, it is really Christ himself who baptizes. He is present in his word, since it is he himself who speaks when the Holy Scriptures are read in the church. He is present, lastly, when the church prays and sings, for he promised, where two or three are gathered in, together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Christ indeed always associates the church with himself in the great work wherein God is perfectly glorified and men are sanctified. The church is his beloved bride who, is called, who calls to her Lord and through him offers worship to the eternal Father. For the conclusion. Before I conclude, I must pause for a moment out of respect to acknowledge a difference between Catholic and Lutheran conception of the faith that is nurtured through preaching. The Catholic tradition and Luther both confess that faith is an unconditional trust in God and a firm belief in and anticipation of the promise of forgiveness and the vision of God's face to face. However, Luther rejected the Catholic belief that the faithful Christians not only clings to God's promise, but also participates now in the inner life of Trinity. When the Catholic Church speaks of faith, it speaks of a participation in the mutual eternal knowledge between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. According to Luke, the Gospel, 10th chapter. This participation in the life of the Trinity entails a different understanding of the grace that comes through faith. Catholicism and Luther both preach that through faith we receive the grace by which God makes us righteous and holy. 
Moreover, grace is certainly forgiveness of sins in light of Christ's cross, and the sinner is justified by God's grace alone. However, for the Catholic tradition, the grace comes through the cross is, in the Catholic view, more than only a decree of forgiveness. The grace that God gives us just as much our real participation in the life of the tree on God, a participation that is inseparable from the virtues of hope and love that come with faith. This is a communion, a fellowship with him in truth and love. Through this grace comes our sanctification, our imitation of Christ, and our configuration to his image. This and not just God's, our experience of God's decree is what it means to become a new creation, children of God. Grace is new life, brings about an unmediated and interior relationship with God. In this life, there is obligation to an authentic following of Christ in the life of according to God's commandments. This includes not only our responsibilities, in our profession, family, and society, but also our responsibilities as a fellow members of the body of Christ in the church, which is his visible presence in the world. And so the gift of forgiveness and fellowship in the triune life initiates a struggle of fear and rambling, as Paul declares to the Philippians. But one, that is equally a matter of rejoicing, for it is God at work within you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Grace of as fellowship in God's life transform every aspect of our own, so that despite of accompanying, accompanying imperfections, our smallest acts of love, our littlest acts of compassion, our respect for one another have the origin and the reality in the life of God himself. Given this view of the spiritual life, no Catholic can deny that it is beautiful fruit of ecumenical dialogue that the controversial opposition of the Church of the Word and the Church of the Sacraments can be overcome by a more authentic understanding of the Lutheran and Catholic traditions, even with their differences. Today, one does not find Catholic theologians defensively limiting the priestly ministry to the offering of the Eucharistic sacrifice, as if preaching were mere preparatory instruction. For every priest is a minister, and every Christian must be a partaker of the word, that is, of Jesus Christ, who reveals the unity of word and sacrament to his apostles when he says, preach the gospel to all creation, and then signaling the dual content of his preaching, of this preaching, he declares, whoever believes and is, is baptized will be saved. Belief and sacrament are in Jesus Christ a unity. Especially given the Catholic understanding of faith, hope, and love as a share in the life of God, how could we bear to let Harnack or to let Catholic defensiveness sequester word from sacrament in a preaching that inspires our faith, overcoming this false dichotomy. We may see the church as Christ's body, functioning fully like a sacrament that is as a sign and instrument both of the very closely knit union with God and the unity of the whole human race. The church does this by continuing the preaching of Jesus, both by word and by deed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Colonel Mueller. Uh, we'll have a question and answer uh, session now. There are two uh, delightful students who have microphones. So if you'd like to ask a question, 
please uh, uh, speak clearly into the microphone. And uh, then, um, is Kai Weiss here? Where are you? Where's Kai? Not here. Uh, yes, you are. Well, c come to the front, because we may, if there's any assistance needed in the translation of the question, it would be wonderful to have you at uh, Cardinal Mueller's elbow to offer it. Uh, Kai is from Cardinal Mueller's own Diocese of Regensburg in Germany. You just go right up there. All right. <laughs> Carry on. Team Burke. <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk, uh, Your Eminence. What steps ought we take as Christians uh, who live on earth? divided by denominational lines, what steps ought we take first and foremost to work toward ecumenical dialogue with each other? And how can we enter more deeply into conversation and into our common Christian faith? Yes, this is not belonging to us. Human beings, we cannot reconstruct only with our forces and understanding the union of all Christians, what is the will of Jesus Christ, when we can pray together, that is, with, uh, when we can overcome all the differences. But we have also to look to the great turn of the ecumenical movements and dialogues in the past, when we were coming from a common uh, Christian tradition, uh, tradition and when the societies were basically a Christian in a Christian uh, culture, there was uh, the dialogue about the sacraments, about justification, about uh, the primacy of the Pope, about uh, the sacramentality of the what is bishop and priest and deacon, sacrament of orders, and the veneration of the saints and uh, the position of Saint Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ in the uh, complete context of our closeness to God. But now, also in our Western world, not only in China, in Asia, in the Muslim world, but also in the American, European world, we have this uh, aggressivity against the basic basics of Christian faith, that we believe in God, in the reality of God, and that we not want to lose our identity in a so-called civil, civil religion when we are together with atheists and only say you know, there is a spiritual background uh, of the world and all religions are the same. And where explicitly uh, they made front a war against our anthropological uh, uh, basic understandings, what is a human being as a creature, man and woman, and what's the meaning of the sexuality in the context of, of the marriage and our anthropology. And therefore, uh, we must stay together, all Christians of different denominations, first in these basics, the belief in God and the defending and promoting the dignity of every body. In this context, we can further discuss about the uh, traditional controversies um, and we can work together in charity, but also in education uh, and in the, the influence we have to promote also in the so-called political discussions it cannot be that your president presents himself as a practicing Catholic, or, but in the same time, um, they are making laws absolutely against the life. The life is coming from God, and we are not the authors of the life only God is he who has the right about life and death. And everybody is equal, and not those people who have uh, are the Forbes list. They have no more 
right since the last poor African in Nigeria. That is absolutely clear. Word and deed, belief and fellowship of Jesus Christ must belong together. And therefore, we need the engagement of real Catholics or evangelical or Protestant uh, Christians in this public discussion about the, the true, uh, true basis of our existence. You are in America, you had the first constitution, democracy, um, but in the modern sense, that truth, life, pursuit of happiness, of fulfillment, of the autonomy, not the state defines what is your luck, but according to your conscience, no, you have to go along. Um, that's coming out of the Enlightenment, Thomas Jefferson, etc. Uh, also Freemasons was implicated, but the basic of the, the content of these ideas are of Christian origin. No? All we are equal created, everybody is creature of God uh, in his image, in his likeness, and in our face, everybody is, can become son and daughter of God, friend of the Holy Spirit, no? and freedom, surely God, the truth make us free, and the freedom and the truth is coming from God, is God himself, that's our, our um, to understand ourselves as brothers and sisters, this is Christian thinking, just beginning from the Old Testament, Jewish Christian thinking, that our values, and surely also um, is approachable by our human reason, but some philosophers outside the historical Christianity, like Platon, Aristoteles, and the Stoa, no? Seneca, Epictate, and all these philosophers had a certain approach that if you look to your own reason, it is absolutely self-evident that all persons have the equal rights and nobody can be decide if other Life is worthy to life or the unworthy to life. Intelligent, less intelligent people, the genius and the normal people and the um, sick, the poor, uh, the rich, all are in uh, immediate relation to God and we are responsible towards him. And this thing, I think this must be uh, also a, a a program, an idea for the future ecumenism. No? But we cannot make a compromise and say, yes, the classical Protestants have only two sacraments, baptism and the Last Supper and other understandings. And Eucharist, and we have seven. Oh, we make the middle, we take together five sacraments. No? <laughs> that is not the logical approach. That would be a commercial, economic thinking, but has nothing to do with our faithfulness to the word of God in our understanding. And for us Catholics, it's, it's clear that the, the number of the sacraments, seven sacraments, is uh, revealed uh, truth. And we cannot make, in this sense, compromises. OK. <clears throat> Your Eminence. Um Somewhat relating to word and deed, I was just wondering if you had any insights into why Christ chose to teach in parables, in stories, as opposed to just teaching blank doctrine. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, Jesus didn't taught in the, in the, in the manner of of the, of the philosophers, of the old Greek philosophers, no? we, we know this and the origins of the sciences, uh, but just in the, in the Old Testament, 
we have these parables and, and, and this understanding the, the images, no? but it's not only a um, um, pedagogical trick, no? it's not only spoken to the simple people and uh, the higher reflected philosophers, they don't need the images, no? because, because also the most abstract concepts we have in our mind are mediated by our, our seeing and touching the reality. No? We have not, like Descartes and others said, we have not idea inate, no? inborn ideas. <laughs> All our understanding begins with the visible world and therefore also the highest abstract concepts has a form of visibility. No? And therefore, um, the parables are the explication of the kingdom of God and not only a trick like to speak of the teacher with young children. All the children can come to the kingdom of God, but in this pedagogical way, he said, uh, the parables are <clears throat> the explication of the reality of the kingdom of God in midst our concrete Life. No? Therefore, um, Jesus did not only you are healed, but he did touch the people with his hands no? and looked them in the eyes no? and then praised them. No? The gestures of Jesus in his human being are the expression of the closeness of God. The kingdom of God is close, is near, is present, but we can, and in, in the, the first uh, letter of St. John, the apostles are, say, apostles are saying what we have seen, what we have touched, no, what we have heard, with all the senses that we are announcing for you, that you have communication with God, the Father and the Son. The communication between God Father and the Son, the triune God, we say, is only possible through the human reality of Jesus Christ. Until these gestures no, and uh, the sophisticated people in the, in the beginning of the Christianity in the old Greek and, and Roman culture said, oh, the, this Platonic philosopher said, it's incredible, God, is the highest idea, have nothing to do with this brutal world. No? But the contrary is the case. No? Jesus, the Son, was in the uh, equalness of, of God, no? and in Philippines, the letter of Philippines, and he humiliated himself and became man under our conditions. That is a, the mystery of Christianity beyond the spiritualistic, idealistic thinking, away from the visible risibility, but of the other side of a materialistic, magical thinking, which has nothing to do with the idea. Thank you, Your Eminence. Um, would you describe to us uh, in the detail which you're permitted, what it's like to be in a papal conclave. <laughs> yes, papal conclave is a, um, was a conclave of the cardinals. No? Yeah, is an is assembly of the cardinals for the election of the coming pope. No? When the pope has died or Pope Benedict resigned, no? Unfortunately, <laughs> I am in principle against this resignation, but also the resignation also of the bishops with 74 years, because the bishop is a father of the faithful, the priest is a father, and you can never become, become retired like in a worldly profession. No? And the bishop is the head of the local church. The pope is a visible head, the principle of the unity 
visible principle of the visible unity of all the churches, the diocese in the world, and therefore it is for my theological understanding and human feeling not so good to give this um, look as if, as if uh, this religious mission of, of the apostles and the, and the, and the, and the bishops uh, is nothing else than a worldly profession. No? You can, cannot uh, understand that uh, the apostle Paul said, now I am 75 years old and, and, and will go in pension. No? <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> but. Uh, so the College of, of the Cardinals has developed in the late um, ancient times and in the Middle Ages uh, because the uh, Pope is a Bishop of Rome and the Bishop of Rome is elected by the Church of Rome. Not all the faithful is impossible by, <clears throat> by the, the seven um, bishops of the suburbs of, of Rome and the, the, the main pastors of the old great parishes of this gigantic, gigantic uh, city of Rome in the old times and uh, of some proto-deacons. And this is, is, is a, um, the kern, the nucleus, the nucleus, the nucleus, nucleus, the nucleus of the later college of the cardinals, no? and they have to pray. No? Who will be the best candidate? Not to say in an infantile way. Now we need an Italian. Others said now we need a black man. And now we need an Asian. All are equal. No? <laughs> It's not, it's not a criteria. Criteria must be a person who is elected by the Holy Spirit, but he must be the successor of, of Jesus Christ, a successor of, uh, of in, the, in, the, in the face of, of Jesus Christ, successor of St. Peter saying, you are Christ, the son of the living God. No? He's responsible for the sound doctrine, for the unity in the church as a good shepherd leading the people of God to the eternal life and to have this uh, understanding. Um, Pope Gregory the Great said, uh, the Pope is Servus Servorum Dei, uh, the first minister of the ministers, is a service uh, for the people, not so important is climate change, uh, or the meetings with the repress representatives of the big reset or politicians. Most important today is to speak about the living God, Jesus Christ, the eternal end we have, what to what end we are existing in the world and to give to everybody hope. No? Hope beyond this short time we are here on earth. No? But we are created since the eternity in the light of the Son, eternal Son of God. And before our earthly existence, we are chosen and elected in the eternal love of God. And therefore, the, our life cannot end here in the moment of our earthly death, like the animals, but this is a last step when we are entering the eternal life. And the eternal life is not eternal because it is time, 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 time without end, but eternal is a participation in the essential eternity of God in, in his substance as love in the relation of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the eternity.
Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for, I think, one more question. Perfect. Uh, first of all, oh, I just wanted to thank you. That was an amazing exposition of the Lutheran view of the sacraments. Uh, and second of all, I just wanted to ask a clarification, because at the end when you were talking about our differences, you mentioned that the Lutheran view of faith doesn't, if I understood you correctly, include love and hope as a, you know, the growth in love and hope as a result of that. So are you referring to like the logical ordering of the two is in occurring simultaneously in Catholic doctrine versus love and hope as a result of faith in Lutheran doctrine? Because that's how I've always heard it connected. So I just wanted to, I wasn't quite clear from the speech. Uh, it's not, um, not, so, not, so, not so easy to explain because uh, we, our concept in theology is uh, Catholic is an objective representation of the ontological basis, the coherence of all, is a more intellectual approach. Um, and Anselm of Canterbury, fides querens intellectum, here we have the face and we want to understand what it is. No? <laughs> uh, but Luther began with a psychological approach. No? As a monk, he lived in his, uh, in his doubts, how can I become a, a, a graceful God? No? For, for, for a theology, a Catholic approach is not easy to understand this approach, but he was just a Christian, he was baptized. It was not necessary to look for a God uh, who will him justify, because he was justified. No? <laughs> just of the beginning, and it was a certain turn of another understanding of faith and grace. No? The basic words is a, is a psychological relation between God and me. No? Not so much the objective reality in the sacraments, in the, in the creed of the church and so but more, I must look, what can I do? And I his experience was, I can nothing do. Only I have the faith. No? Only I can project all my faith and my confidence to God. And this moment, through this faith as confidence, I am justified. No? Could be for us only also an aspect of our spirituality, but we cannot say these are two uh, equal approaches. No? We must <laughs> stay by, by this more objective reality. No? And in the Old Testament, also in, in, in St. Paul, in the letter to the Romans, was not this question of Luther. No? This was the understanding of some Jews, they said, the old law in the Old Testament, that is a way of uh, salvation and justification. And St. Paul and also the church is saying, no, the faith and Jesus, the Christ, no? not only inner uh, belief, but the real confessional belief in Jesus, the Christ, that is a justification, but not uh, doing a part the law, the Divide the, 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 the Ten Commandments, but they are integrated no? in the belief and the hope and the love of God. No? Yeah, not uh, lawless people no? that I believe in God and, and then I can do what I want. No, no. <laughs> exactly, because I believe in God who gave you, he, he revealed his salvific will. The, the commandments are the will of God who shows us the good way in the, the best direction. No? But in and through and with Jesus Christ, his son. The, the commandments cannot stay a part of Jesus Christ. So the, apartment, so the commandments of the Old Testament are, have his fullness in the person of the word who became flesh. No? Therefore, we can surely come closer in the doctrine of justification. 
but we cannot, as Catholics, only uh, remain by this aspect that, that is, a, is only the, the, the grace and the faith is only a consolation of my wounded conscience. No? Uh, this was in Luther in his special biography, in a special monastic background. No? And I think we um, has to say also that faith is not only this consolation of my uh, wounded uh, conscience, uh, my feeling uh, a deep sinner, no? but the faith is also an elevation of our real existence of, to the level of God. No? And we are a new creation, not only we are feeling as if we are a new creation, we are, we, um, we are uh, set children of God, no? sons of God, in the first letter, St. John, we are children of God. No? This is an ontological basis, that not only this psychological meaning, but like we of the Catholic theology, we can integrate the psychological elements. No? Santa Teresa of Avila, no? St. Ignatius, they had also this psychological approaches, no? the deep mystical sense, no? experience to be a sinner and so, but integrated in this objective ontological reality of the revelation and of the, the deeds of God. No? Not only, not only um, a declaration, no? the, the revelation is not only a declaration, you are redeemed, you are, uh, but is a realization, the reality, you know, the, the incarnation is a reality, is the reality of God in the world. You know? And therefore, this Catholic thinking, creation, incarnation, sacraments, the real presence in the uh, of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, no? and then there was a, the reproaches against Luther of Zwingli no? in, in this uh, discussion of Marburg, that he is not consequent in his thinking. No? If you are be, yeah, believing that only in the spoken word, only in the faith, we are um, redeemed, why it is necessary that Christ is really uh, corporally, bodily present in the speeches of bread and wine. No? This is only logical in this line of creation, the federation alliance of God he made with his people in the history, in the incarnation, presence in the sacraments, in the church as a body of Christ, not only a religious organization, and only, only a reunion of believers, but is a body of Christ, no? this bodily presence of Christ in the real presence. And only um, the Catholic Church, surely also the uh, Orthodox uh, churches have the same basis, are believing in this real presence of Jesus Christ with his body and flesh in this human humanity and his divinity in, in the Eucharist. No? And this is for all this um, idealistic interpretation of Christianity in the new times, no? in the Descartes and the idealism of Hegel and all these uh, philosophers are coming out from the Protestant uh, tradition or the Swingley tradition also, Calvinistic a tradition uh, for them all is a scandal no? to make um, um, to kneel to kneel before a piece of bread in the on the altar. No? They are saying this is only bread. How Catholics are ador adoring a, a, a slice of bread. No? <laughs> But we are knowing, as Catholics are believing, 
that there's only the species of bread and wine, but the reality, the substance, the inner sub sub subsist, uh, substance is the real presence of Jesus Christ. And we are partaking, eating, we are living by the body and blood of Jesus Christ in a sacramental way. <coughs> Uh, we live from the word of God who is coming out of the mouth of God, but this is the same word who become flesh in Jesus Christ and is present in the Eucharist and because Jesus said also, I am the bread, no? the bread coming from the heaven who is eating my blood and drinking my blood has the eternal life. No? 